This is Buenos Aires in Argentina, a city renowned for its love of dancing. It was Buenos Aires that gave the world the tango. But a few years ago, something very unusual happened here. Something which is sure to give this city a new focus of world attention and be a far greater gift than the tango could ever be. What happened and what science has to say about it may provide us with answers to some of the most fundamental questions about life and human existence. The story begins in this building on a busy street in the commercial district of Buenos Aires the Santa Maria Parish Church. At the centre of this story is a priest, Padre Alexandro Pizet, and what he has to say about what happened here in 1996. It was a Sunday, I had to celebrate the evening mass at 7 o'clock p.m. I was giving the communion to the people and a woman came to me and said, Father, I, I have seen a host. It's there. I was in the middle of the church in that side. Uh, and when went to that place and I found the host in a little thing where they put the candles near a, a wood Christ. It was very dusty, that, that thing, and the, uh, that's why I didn't eat the host. Because normally when a host goes to the floor, uh, you eat it. I, I, I don't give it to the people who come to me. <laughs> Father Alexandro took the initiative to tell me to go and put the host in a patina a crystal bowl that we use for baptism. I put this much water in, and I put it in the tabernacle in a corner, so that if anyone opened it, they would not disturb the vessel with the host. On Monday, the 26th of August, at 8 a.m. Mass, I went to see if the host had dissolved. I went to the tabernacle, pulled out the vessel, and I noticed that the host was red. It looked like blood. It was very clear. Monday, 26th of August, I was praying in the church close to the uh, to the tabernacle, and the uh, old an old woman who is uh, the Eucharist minister, uh, a saint woman that I know her very well. She said to me, uh, "Oh, Alejandro, does something strange in that house." you left in the tabernacle. I look and I found this. And it looked like the color of the blood. I, well, I took it to the house, the, the parish house. I left it in another tabernacle that we have there. We had there. What happened was that in the next days, the part of the host that was white became red also. You can see the, the, the decent uh, half red and half white, it was everything red. Uh, that made me know that, that there wasn't nobody was who, who put that there because uh, they, nobody could have access. Uh, to the place where now it was. Um, well, that's what happened in that time. Nobody pushes me to do to say this. I, I'm sure that this was what happened. And that, that's why I, I am telling it to you. Padre Alexandro says that a month after the transformation of the communion host had occurred, 
The substance was transferred into a glass test tube containing distilled water. It remained that way undisturbed for three years before permission was given for it to be examined in 1999. Pope Francis, who was then Archbishop Bergoglio of Buenos Aires, wanted this very unusual matter in his diocese investigated. He asked Dr Ricardo Castanon to carry out that investigation. For a number of years I've been examining claims of unusual happenings associated with Catholic faith. So I was delighted when I was given the opportunity to work on the investigation of what had happened in Buenos Aires. It seemed a very interesting case. Mike Willisey, a renowned Australian investigative journalist, also became involved. I can say that it has been a fascinating journey of scientific investigation and discovery that has already taken more than 15 years. It has involved the examination of similar cases in different countries with different scientists and different laboratories. The results which we will present in this program and in follow-up programs in the making are truly outstanding, as you will see. Our first steps in October of 1999 were to interview the witnesses and then to take a sample for analysis. When I accepted the challenge of assisting in the investigation of this most extraordinary claim, I was aware that similar claims have been made in the past and that they'd have often been regarded with scepticism. So as I filmed these scenes of taking of a sample, I was conscious of the task ahead to ensure that every important detail on the path of investigation was accurately recorded as it happened. So just what was this mysterious substance? And how did it get to be there? Now began our quest to find answers. The glass tube containing a small piece of the substance was labelled for identification, packaged and then sealed. We had been given custody and the freedom to do any tests that were needed. The first step in having the material identified was pathology testing and it was New York forensic pathologist Dr Frederick Zuckerby that was to give the most definitive answer as to what the substance was. He was told nothing of the origin of the sample. Looking at it, he had no doubts about what this was and where it had come from. Heart tissue. Uh, there's a inflammatory infiltrate here, but the inflammatory infiltrate is mixed. It's a mixed. Uh, it, it's actually uh, mixed here. In other words, uh, the heart tissue itself is degenerating. Is degenerative. In other words, this is what happens sometimes after a, a a heart attack. This is a person that had a heart attack, but not. It's not a immediate. In other words. The person had to have lived a period of time after this uh, for oh, at least uh, a, a few days, at least after this. Now, uh, there's other things that can cause this type of a item that resembles a heart attack. In automobile accidents, uh, where they get uh, chest crushed and it causes uh, uh, damage. Uh, to the heart. You get it from pe a person getting beat up across the chest. You get, uh, you get coronary uh, injuries from that. You get coronary injuries from people who gave CPR incorrectly and a person comes out of it, that area may uh, 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 die off. If, say, the injury hit this area of the heart right here, that person would probably die because that's a major anterior descending coronary artery, left main circumflex artery, uh, uh, there, that would stop uh, bringing oxygen and, uh, and nutrition to that part of the heart, and that part of the heart will then die. If it was over here, then 
a part, this part of the heart would die. The rest of the heart would look perfectly fine. You know, I've written over 100 papers in, in, on, uh, uh, in cardiology. I was director of cardiovascular research with the Veterans Hospital. I'm a full fellow in the American College of Cardiology as well as being a forensic pathologist. And uh, the heart is one area that I know. Yep. This is my business. By the, uh, uh, the fold of it, it's, it's really not too far. Uh, it's not too far from the valvular area. I think it actually comes from about, uh, about right in this area, right in here. And what's the function of that part of the heart? That's the left ventricle. That's a major uh, area that pumps the blood to all parts of the body. Uh, that's the le left ventricle is when all the blood comes back to the heart and the heart contracts and shoots the blood out to the brain and to all other parts. It has to be shot out through there. The right ventricle only pumps the blood to the lungs to get oxygenated for oxygen purposes. Yeah. Now what's the history? Dr. Zugabi was then told the history of the sample. His first reaction was brief. That is amazing. The question we all ask is, could this story be true? How could a communion host, which is essentially bread, turn to heart? Has there been some sort of human intervention to bring this about? The witnesses say that it was a communion host made of flour and water that Emma Fernandez put in the bowl on the 18th of August, and that when the locked tabernacle containing the bowl was opened eight days later, on the 26th of August, this is what they saw. It was captured on film by a professional photographer. And you took those photographs, did you? Yes. yes. In the first instance, the communion host is still visible, but with frayed edges within the surrounding ready substance. A week later, after the bowl had been locked away in another place, a further transformation was noticed and photographed. The communion host is seen in a much broken down state. Immediately beneath the particles of the host and following the outline of its shape, there is a dark coloured substance. The host and the dark substance seem to have a close relationship to each other. This would dispel any suggestion that the communion host had been removed by someone and replaced with a piece of living heart tissue a vital section of the heart that, if removed even by a surgeon, would have caused the death of a person. The photos that were taken strongly support what the witnesses say happened. The photographer was asked how he felt when he took the photos. It was impressive. Really, I think there are no words to explain it. The witnesses may seem credible, but a determination that there has been no human intervention involved will most likely come from science itself. One of the issues has to do with the white blood cells found in the heart tissue that remain vital after being kept in water for three years, something which is scientifically impossible for anyone to do. Uh, it looks like old, old blood is what I would think of. Forensic pathologist Dr Robert Lawrence of San Francisco who also examined the sample, spoke of those white blood cells. I think we can just start with a close-up on this. And mixed in it are these white cells, these little dots that you see. And I'll go under higher power. If this material had been placed directly into water after it was taken off a body, I would expect these cells to be dissolved. If you put cells in, in water yeah. under they, such conditions... They would be expected to dissolve. How long? A few uh, minutes to an hour or two, at the most. So uh, they were they were active, living white cells at the time they were collected. Mm. Mm. Another issue is the question of how the heart tissue could have been made to survive in water for three years. That tissue was in water for three years. That is fantastic. 
Are you sure that was water and not formaldehyde? We're, we're sure it was water. That's hard to believe because the tissue in here shows good fixation. And it would be amazing. The liquid was tested at the University of Queensland. And okay. we have here the solution mm. that it came in. Okay. We've been told it's water. Yep. We've also been told by pathologists that if it was water, then the white cells that you'll see there would not be existing. Mm. In other words, they right. don't believe that that's water. Yep. So I'll leave that with you also. Okay. It found no evidence of preservative chemicals and that the liquid was essentially water. If that was just in a water uh, itself, you, you get what they call autolysis. Autolysis is that the body itself releases enzymes that act literally completely destroy the tissue. The big thing about it is, that's really so funny, here it's heart muscle. But those cells are not normally there. Those inflammatory cells are not normally there. They come in as a reaction to injury. These cells have to come from other areas of the body in order to do that. But if that was a piece of Eucharist, where did those cells come from? Dr. Zugabi's assessment was that he was looking at the heart tissue of a living person who had suffered severe trauma a few days before. Is there any way we can know who that person is? DNA testing procedures today are well advanced and are used to identify people. The genetic code of a person is routinely extracted from the nuclei of white blood cells if those cells are in a good state of preservation. Dr Lawrence confidently tells us that that's certainly the case here. The nuclei are the dark purple or here they look brown. Those are the nuclei and they're definitely in a good state of preservation. So there would be DNA, DNA material on these. If you wanted to test these for DNA, you should be able to, to uh, detect DNA. The sample was brought to this respected forensic laboratory in California for DNA testing. Okay. And I just need your signature. Let's put both labels on the outside, if that's okay. They reported that they could not obtain a genetic profile. This was not what we had expected. What we do know is that each of us has a unique genetic code that can be detected in the standard DNA tests. That code is a genetic profile which is a combination of genetic information given to us by our mother and father only through sexual union. We might ask why is it that there's no genetic profile in this case. This mystery is the subject of further investigation. If we accept the facts and the scientific findings of this Argentina case, then we can say without doubt that living heart tissue has emerged from a communion host. That is to say, life has come from non-living matter. Life in its most complex form has come into being spontaneously, without evolution, and without ancestry. This must be of immense interest to science on those big questions about life, its origin and its evolution. When we look at the world around us, we see and admire the beauty of life in its many forms. Each instance is a cause to pause and to wonder. Each flower is an awe-inspiring work of art that colours our world. All of this a source of joy to us humans, the most sophisticated at the end of the line in the progression of life. But life was not always the case. We are told that there was a time when life did not exist at all. Scientists tell us that about 14 billion years ago there was a big bang in the universe and matter formed but not life. Life, it is said, came 3.5 billion years ago, when matter and energy were in the right place at the right time, the forces of nature produced a very primitive form of life. Just how it happened is not known. 
that first primitive form of life is said to have evolved and produced all forms of life we see on Earth today. Many unproven theories have been advanced, but the search for how life started still goes on. Harvard, one of the world's most prestigious universities, has joined the search. It has an ambitious program to attempt to find the answer to one of the biggest unsolved questions in science. The current lack of knowledge was openly conceded by famous Oxford professor Richard Dawkins to an interviewer, Ben Steen. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it might start it. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, no. It may seem surprising to us that ever since the advent of the scientific era and all the research that has been done by scientists over the centuries, no one has any idea how life began. But science does tell us today that it knows with certainty how we as humans came to be here. And that idea came from a 19th century English botanist, Charles Darwin. It was here, in this pleasant country village outside London, that Darwin lived. It was in this room that he wrote his famous book, The Origin of Species. In it, he outlined his theory of evolution, a theory that has brought about one of the great intellectual revolutions of human history and drastically changed our way of looking at the world and our place in it. This is London, a city graced with magnificent buildings, reflecting the glory of its past. Many are identified by their association with highly honoured and influential people that have left their mark in the history of the world. No less is London's Natural History Museum, sometimes called the Cathedral to Nature. It was built as a monument to Darwin's big revolutionary idea. It was revolutionary because it explained in a very different way how humans came to be here. Darwin had observed what is now generally accepted, that minor changes can occur within a species over time as a result of environmental conditions, like what he saw in the size of the beaks of finches on the Galapagos Islands. From this observation of what might have happened within a species, Darwin went on to extrapolate that such a thing might also happen between species. This led to his grand theory of evolution. Darwinian theory assumes that after life started, it went on to evolve. Simple forms evolved into more complex forms. And after billions of years of evolution, this process produced every instance of life we see on Earth today. No direct evidence of evolution of one species into another has yet been found, but similarities of features seen in different species is relied upon to make the case. Darwin used the illustration of a tree to explain his theory. At the base you start with that single cell. The theory then proceeds with the idea that within nature there is a creative process at work. Small random mutations which might occur in a species and which are beneficial to a species' survival, are passed on to the next generation. Over billions of years, the mutations accumulate and result in successive new species being formed. Humans are at the top of one evolutionary branch. Darwin's theory is now almost universally accepted by science. In essence, the theory maintains that every instance of life on Earth today has to be the product of this evolutionary process and has to have descended from that very first cell, the common ancestor to all life. No life form can be on earth today unless it has come from that tree. But what about the Argentina case? There was living heart muscle tissue and living white blood cells. These arrived spontaneously. There was no billions of years of evolution. They were not part of Darwin's tree 
and there was no ancestral connection back to the first cell at the base of Darwin's tree. Darwinian theory can no longer claim that all life is a product of an evolutionary process when there is now direct evidence of a case which is not a product of that process. Darwinian theory is an all or nothing theory. One exception brings the theory down, and that has now happened. But there's something else that comes from the Argentina case, and it goes to the question of the origin of life itself, the origin of the very first cell. Remember in the Argentina case, Dr. Lawrence pointed out the presence of those white blood cells. Let us look at just one of those. A cell like this is the basic unit of life. It is evidence of life. The cell is the most complex and mystifying item ever encountered in the study of biology. Each tiny cell has been likened to a functioning city, and yet all those you see on this screen could fit on the tip of a pin. It takes this university student textbook of over 1,000 pages to attempt to explain the cell. Something of the complexity of the cell is seen in this chart of its biochemical pathways. From the outside, the cell gains its fuel to run its own power plant with multiple tiny engines, and this gives life and function to the body. It has a highway system, a water supply system, a waste system, a command centre, and much more. The cell has been likened to a tiny factory with thousands of beautifully designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery, far more complicated than any machinery built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. The detail in this chart is more complex than the circuit diagram of the world's most advanced computer. It shows how the cell is programmed to perform and to combine all its functions. It is a marvel of detailed and complex architecture. But it is what is in the nucleus, the command centre, that is most fascinating. It houses information written in digital language that contains the genetic code, the programs that govern your life, your health and your reproductive ability. Also the cell is what empowers your brain to have the capacity to think and to reason, and what empowers the brain of a scientist to process and make sense of the complex information of the cell itself. The information content is said to be equivalent to 100 million pages of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. This complex programming and content we would normally expect to come from a designing entity, a brilliant mind. The rules of biology say that cells can only ever come from other existing cells. But the question remains, where did the first cell come from and how did it get to be so complex and contain such obvious evidence of magnificent design, engineering, logic and purpose? Science says that what you see was not designed at all. The appearance of design is an illusion because Darwinian evolutionary theory tells us that the blind, random, mindless and unguided forces of nature can and did self-assemble that first cell. And it did it through a process of chemical evolution with numerous successive slight modifications over billions of years. Just how is not known. But in the Argentina case, we had living white blood cells. They were as complex in their makeup as we saw in this chart. And they came into being spontaneously and not by billions of years of evolution. The case provides direct evidence that those unproven assumptions about evolution are clearly not correct. Darwin himself said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. We know as a fact that those complex white blood cells and the heart tissue in the Argentina case are a present day reality and were not formed by any evolutionary process. On Darwin's own test, his theory has absolutely broken down, and the ramifications will be immense. The whole of evolutionary theory will now need to be rethought and rewritten. 
But the Argentina case is not the only case where the facts and scientific findings will present a challenge to Darwin's theory. There are others. There is a case in Stokolga in Poland. In this church on the 12th of October in 2008, a communion host was dropped on the floor while communion was being distributed. The host was put in a bowl of water and locked in the tabernacle. Seven days later, when the tabernacle was opened, a transformation of the host was noticed. The content was then poured onto a linen cloth and allowed to dry. Two professors of pathology from the Medical University of Ballastock took samples and examined them. They reported a finding that the substance was human heart muscle from a heart that had suffered and that under the microscope they could see the heart muscle fibres were finely intertwined with the fibres of the host, something the professors say ruled out any possibility of human intervention. There is also this case in Lanciano in Italy. In this church in the year 750 AD, it is said that during the Mass at the time of consecration, the bread and wine transformed in front of all those present. The relics have been kept on display for 1300 years. In 1971, they were examined by Italian professor Odoardo Linoli. He found that the substance was flesh and blood. The flesh he identified as heart muscle and it was from the same part of the heart as was found in the Argentina case. And there is this case in Tixla in Mexico. On the 21st of October in 2006, during communion time, it was noticed that one of the hosts in the chalice was spotted with a blood-like substance. Samples were taken and examined by pathologists in Mexico. They reported a finding that the sample contained white blood cells and heart muscle tissue. The tissue was from a heart that had also suffered, like what was found in the Argentina case and the Poland case. The question remains, can science ever tell us whose heart it is, and is it the same person in each case? The quest to find the answers is the subject of documentaries that will follow in this series.